and we welcome you to the Revelation of Jesus Christ, a study of the book of Revelation, and we are coming down to the very close of the book. In fact, looking at chapter 21 in this presentation. And so we hope that as we have gone through the book of Revelation, that it has helped you understand this great, great book that God has given for you and I that are living today. And we hope that you will continue, even after we have finished, that you'll continue to study and look at the book because I can tell you, you don't get to the bottom of it. That you don't. I've studied it now for years, and I still find new things all the time. So you're not going to you're not going to de deplete the book. You just spend time in it. The Lord will bless you. If you do, you'll be blessed in a special way. And we'd like to welcome all of you that are here and those that are watching by television or you're listening on the radio or on the internet. We're very happy that you're have tuned in, and we hope that as you go through this presentation this evening, that it will bless you in a special way. So we encourage you to get out your Bible, get you a pencil and some paper, and take notes, because we're going to take a close look at this wonderful city that God has prepared for you and for me. Revelation, the 21st chapter. Uh, this is a culmination of all that God has promised. And so you'll be blessed as we go along. One more chapter left, and that's our next presentation. That's the last one, chapter 22, The Victory is Won. It's what we'll be looking at in chapter 22. Uh, in that chapter, there is a very, very interesting uh, observation that God makes concerning each one of you, and seriously, about each one of you, and certain things that God has in mind about you and concerning what you will do. And so we hope you will be here as you're listening on the radio or television as we go into chapter 22. The victory is won. I think you'll find it very, very encouraging to you. We've been blessed, we're thankful to have with us the His Voice Quartet. They have been a great blessing to me, and I appreciate them very much. They're going to sing a wonderful song today. They're going to sing a song entitled, Ride On King Jesus, and you'll be blessed by it. But before they do, Chuck's going to come, and he's going to read, folks, Revelation 21, and the first five verses of chapter 22. All that goes together. So follow carefully as he reads. Well, if you have your Bibles, please take them and turn them to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and we'll read together. So if you have your Bibles, let's read together now. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also she had a great high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the west, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with twelve, and he measured the city the reed, with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its walls, one hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its walls was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation of the wall were of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardinox, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nation of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the king of the earth brings their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of it, its nation into it. But there shall be no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22, and he showed me, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its streets, and in either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve manner of fruits, each tree yielding its fruits every month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall be there. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. May God add his blessing to his word. The 21st chapter of Revelation actually opens with Christ reaffirming a commitment that he made to his people. Years and years ago, he made this commitment to his people. He said, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. So he made a covenant with people, with his people all those down through the ages that have accepted him, walked with him, followed him, these are his people. And he said, I will be your God, and you shall be my people. That's the covenant he made with them and with you and with me. So the 21st chapter of Revelation 
opens with him restating that. Because he says here, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with... Ah, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So there's the covenant that he made way back in the beginning, and he said, Now the time has come. You see, sin is no more. That's all been done away with. Now it's opening up into eternity, and he said, These are my people, and I will be their God, and I will dwell with them. That he's going to be with his people, that he's going to be their God. And so he continues on and says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What's that telling you? It's all gone. Sin's no more. There's no sorrow. There's no pain. All that is past. The former things are passed away. Glory, hallelujah. There'll be no more of that. See, it's all over. That's where he starts this, this chapter in Revelation saying that you and I can rejoice because all these things that's been going on for 6,000 years has come to an end. He has made an end to sin. And now, eternity can begin in which righteousness and joy and goodness will rule. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Wonderful. All things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true sayings said, I'm going to make all things new. All this is true. Uh, God is coming back, and what he's doing is emphasizing it for you and for me, saying, listen, this is true. You can depend on it. No question about it. All things are new. That's what he did at his coming. As far as you and I are concerned, he made us new, changed us. Behold, I tell you, mystery, we shall all sleep but we shall all be changed, made new, you see? That's going to be wonderful. In a moment, in a twink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, be made new. I know there's some of you that uh, when I come out here at night and I kneel, you wonder if I'm going to get up or not. <laughs> they, uh, well, I've got to admit, age does make a difference, and it has its effect on you, no question about it. But there is coming a day when it will all be new. That will not be that way anymore, no question about it. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Won't that be wonderful? Put on immortality. Never, never down through the eons of time, never again. Will death ever cross the whole stage? Never will it be thought of. Be no more. It's over. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades. Where is your victory? Marvelous. Took our bodies and made them brand new. There won't be. There will not be such a thing as age. Age only comes to it because there is an end. But when you get to eternity and there is no end, there's no age ceases to be, so you and I will be made brand new. Think about it. 
how wonderful that'll be. Think all the things that we face today, all the pain and the heartache and the suffering and all, no more. And, you know, as you grow older, all of us face the sad experience. You know, we grow older, and as we grow older, we, our friends grow older. You know, and as they grow older, some of them pass away. And sin does that because we live in a world of sin and death. But that will be no more. Not only will that be no more, he's going to take this old earth and make it brand new. And it will be like something that we have never seen nor could imagine. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. So, going to build houses. We're going to inhabit them. Going to plant vineyards, eat the fruit of them. It will all be new. I guarantee you, it will be a different kind of work. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the works of their hands. The wilderness and the waste place shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. That will be wonderful. I don't know if you've ever spent much time on the desert. But the first few years of my ministry, I spent about five years basically through the desert. And I can guarantee you it will take a miracle of God to make it blossom as a rose. But it will. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon, and they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. So wonderful. Our bodies will all be made brand new. The earth will be made completely new. God will create it and everything will be in perfection and will work as it should. So there will not be anything that will be against it anymore. All that he promises for us. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor hath entered into the heart of men the things which God prepared for those who loved him. That I have not seen nor ear heard he can't imagine what it's like. I've often thought about that. When I was a kid in school, I can remember all of us kids went to town one day or over the weekend. Got in town, and here were placards and posters up all over the town saying the circus was... You know, and uh, we, we all got excited about the circus coming to town. I... I grew up out in the country, and I just lived about two miles away from this little town. I mean, very, if you blink, you missed it, and a uh, little town. And so if something came our way, that was a big deal. I mean, and so the circus coming to town, that was a great, great big deal. So when we got back to school, that's what all of us kids did. We played circus. I mean, that's what we did, and I mean... We had huge lions. We had elephants. We flew from trapezes. We did somersaults. We did things in our imagination that was absolutely fantastic as we played circus. And then I'll never forget, the circus got there. And I went to the circus. And it wasn't near as good as my imagination. <laughs> it just won't be that way in heaven. It'll always be greater because our eye can't see or our ear heard. Can't imagine the things that God has prepared for those who love him. This is what he's done for you and for me. So let's take a look at this city. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Indeed, he's the bridegroom. He's gone. He's prepared this place with his own hands for his bride. And now this city is coming down to the earth. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So when it's talking about the city, it says that it is 12,000 furlongs. The length, the bright, breadth, and height are equal. In other words, it's 12,000 furlongs wide. It's 12,000 furlongs long. And it is 12,000 furlongs high. Because it says its length and breadth and height are equal. So if you have something that is 12,000 furlongs wide, 12,000 furlongs long, and 12,000 furlongs high, what do you have? You got a cube. That's what you got. And that's what it says that it is. It's 12,000 furlongs. It's a cube. Now, if you got 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth, the height of it are equal, and that's a cube, okay? Then if you've got that, how many edges do you have to a cube? Why don't you think a little bit? You got six sides, but I didn't say sides. I said edges. How many edges do you have? Twelve. Exactly. So if you got 12,000 furlongs and you've got 12,000 edges, because each side, each edge is 12,000 furlongs, so if you multiply 12 times 12,000, what does that give you? It gives you 144,000. See? That gives you 144,000. I know that's saying 1,200, but it's not right. It's 12,000 furlongs is what it's supposed to be. 12,000 furlongs. So it's 12,000 furlongs high, 12,000 furlongs wide, 12,000 furlongs long. The city is a cube. There's a reason for that, folks, a very, very definite reason. Now, there are eight furlongs in a mile, okay? So if you divide eight by into 12,000, what does that give you? See how your math is. Well, that tells you that it is... 375 miles on a side. So that city is 375 miles long, 375 miles wide, and 375 miles high. You and I can't really comprehend that very well when you, when you start trying to put it together. The city basically is the size of the state of Colorado because that's just about what the state of Colorado is and so the city is that size and this is a city that Christ has prepared and let me tell you something I have people I've talked to from time to time and they say to me oh brother Cox I'm not concerned about that because there wouldn't be room for me let me tell you something there's room in that city for every man woman, and child that has ever lived. There is room for you there, I will guarantee you. Amen. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates, and the name written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes 
of the children of Israel. So in this wall are 12 gates. On, at each gate is an angel. And over the top of each gate is the name of one of the tribes of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Three gates on each side. And the name written on them, which are the name of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So over one gate would be the name of Judah. Over another gate would be the name of Benjamin. Over another gate would be the name of Simeon. Over the number, 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 another gate would be the name of Gad. So you have the different tribes of the children of Israel, a name over each one. Hmm. I thought the city was a city for all people. Hmm? Well, then let me ask you, which gate are you going through? Because over each gate is one of the names of the tribes of Israel. And you've got to go through a gate. You can't crawl over the wall. So you've got to go through a gate. So which gate are you going to go through? Well, the reason it's that way, folks, is because it has to do with the children of Israel. You see, each one of the sons of Jacob was different in character. And you find in Genesis 49 that Jacob tells the characteristics of his son. You find other places in Scripture where it tells the characteristics of their son. And so according to your personality, according to your character, you will go in through that gate into the city because all of us will fit into one of those character patterns. All of us are there, and we will go into that city through that particular gate. The reason that's there is because God has made provisions for every one of you to be saved. See, there are no characteristics that God in His grace can't change. He can change any of us. Then He measured the wall. 144 cubits according to the measure of a man. That is of an angel. 144 cubits. There's different people that think different things about this and this it's not really defined real clear here rather when it says the wall is 144 cubits rather it's saying it's that in height or rather it's saying it's that in width there are many people who believe that refers to width not to height because if you stop and think about it if the city is a 375 miles high and the wall to it it wouldn't be out of proportion for it to be 144 cubits wide. But anyhow, that has a wall, a great wall, all around the city. The construction of its wall was of jasper. The city was pure gold like clear glass. You see, we, we do not understand and we don't know how you refine gold until it becomes clear. But evidently God does. And the streets are pure gold and the wall are pure gold like unto clear glass. It says like jasper. And the closest thing to jasper there is diamond. So it says that the city will be like diamond. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. Now, folks, you can't have a city... That is 375 miles long on each side. And it has three gates in that 375 miles and walls that are no telling how tall and have little dinky gates. I mean, they just, that just does not fit uh, architecturally. It just doesn't fit. Those gates are huge. And think, here these are, huge, huge gates, 
and they're made out of one pearl. Uh, you, you see, it staggers the imagination to figure what God has done for his people. And they'll come, and there they will be, all of God's people, and going through those gates into the city, glorious city that he's prepared. The streets of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. What you, you see, what you and I today hold dear and consider of monetary value, there has no value at all. Because the streets are pure gold. The streets are, as we consider, asbestos, asphalt. Streets, pure gold. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. On them were the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This city had 12 foundations, and if you look at it, those are the stones that were read to you in the reading. And those stones, if you line them up as I have put them there, that's the colors of them, and they make up the color of the rainbow. That is the foundations that's under the city, colors of the rainbow, beautiful as that city sets on those 12 foundations. Okay, the foundation and the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third was caledonia, and the fourth was emerald. And so we have these different stones that made up the foundation of the city. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Now that text does not say that there is no sun and there is no moon. That doesn't say that. It says that the sun and the moon are not needed what it says. They're not needed there. Why? Because Christ is there. God is there. And he is the light of the city. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Las Vegas. Been to Las Vegas? Well, if you ever go to Las Vegas, you'll, there's one particular place down the strip there that they have a light that shines out of the top of it. And you can literally see it for miles and miles and miles away. And that's what I think about that city. I mean, if God is the light, just think that that light will shine out of that city. That probably can be seen from outer space. As God is the light of that city. Marvelous that he's there. There'll be no need of the sun or of the moon. Its gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. No, there won't be any night there because God is the light. There shall be no night there. They, they need no lamp for light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. So you have this marvelous city that he has prepared for you and for me to live in. That'll be a marvelous time. The righteous will live in that city for a thousand years before they come to this earth. At the end of the thousand years, that new Jerusalem will come to this earth. And then the righteous will be able to live in the city or they'll have the privilege, if they want to, of living out on the earth. And the earth has been made brand new, and it says that we'll build houses and inhabit them. Have you given any thought to that? Huh? Sure, you should be, because you're going to build it. Christ built you one in the city, but you're going to build the one out in the country. 
Have you decided what you're going to do? Now, I don't know about you, but I've already started making plans. You know, I'm planning on being there. I'm planning on going there. One wall in my bedroom is going to be made out of solid diamond, the whole wall. Now, you've got to understand, resources is no problem, folks. That's, that's not like here. Resources is no problem. So that wall is going to be made out of diamond. The wall on the other side I'm going to have made out of living roses. Just think how nice that will smell and how nice it will look reflecting in that diamond wall. Uh, anything that you can think or you can imagine you can do. And also, time won't be a factor. If you want to take a thousand years to build it, that's your privilege. You're not out on the street. You're not, you know, hurting for a place to live. That's not the deal. You can build it however you want to. That will be your home in the new earth. Just when you build it, Build it well, because it's there for eternity. See? So build it well when you build it. God will have all these places for us that will be there. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. So out of God's throne flows this river as clear as crystal crystal. Just think of what the water of life will taste like when there'll be no pollution, absolutely perfectly pure, that you and I can drink from it. And in the middle of the street on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So there in the New Jerusalem is a tree of life. It bears its fruit every month. I have a friend that told me that that meant that it would bear 12 different varieties of mangoes. <laughs> but I don't know that that's true. <laughs> But it bears its fruit every month. It also says that you and I are going to come up to the New Jerusalem to worship every week on the Sabbath. We're going to come worship Him on the Sabbath. But it also says that we're going to also come to the New Jerusalem to worship every new moon that all the righteous will come and worship God on the new moon. How often do you have a new moon? Once a month. How often does the tree bear its fruit? Once a month. So they're going to come from all over the earth and sit down and eat of the tree of life and worship God. That will be a wonderful time. I anxiously wait for that day. You know, I particularly miss it this time of the year for the next few months, I, I really like peaches. Uh, they're probably my favorite fruit. And, of course, when you get out of the peach season, you get in the winter, you miss them. And uh, I will be so happy to be able to get to heaven and get hold of a nice, great, big, ripe, juicy peach and bite into it, and I have to worry about the worm having to beat me there. You know, <laughs> just all the wonderful things that God has prepared for you and for me. And we'll eat of the tree of life there. Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have right to the, what? Tree of life, that they may enter in through the gates into the city. So they're going to come worship God in the New Jerusalem. Now follow me carefully, folks. Because this is something I want you to get hold of. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests 
and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. He said, you shall be a kingdom of priests. He gives you some very definite, wonderful promises. But you, this is speaking of you and I as Gentiles, it says, but you are a what? Chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has called you and me to be priest and has made to and has made us kings and priest to his God and Father to him be glory dominion forever and ever so God says that he has taken and has made us kings and priests to his God all right and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, his priest. They shall see his face, his name shall be on their foreheads. Just often wonder, think of what it will be to reach out and take somebody's hand and find it to be God's hand. To look into the face of Jesus. You know, that song that we sing, face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, that died for me. How marvelous that he will be there. He will be our God. We shall be his people. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Now it says that in the New Jerusalem, there is no temple, because he is the temple thereof. So there's no temple in the New Jerusalem. Real reason for that I want you to look at. You see, the sanctuary of old was made after the pattern of of the one up in heaven. Now watch, it says, and the inner sanctuary, that is the holy of holies, okay, the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. What do you got? Got a cube, okay, all right. He overlaid it with pure gold and overlaid the altar of cedar. So here you have the most holy place. This is where the throne of God is, and it is a cube. 20 wide, 20 long, 20 high. Exact cube. So, the New Jerusalem is a cube. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him, just the same as the Holy of Holies was the place where God dwelt, where his throne was, so the new Jerusalem will be where God dwells and will be where his throne is. Therefore, there is no need of a temple there because the new Jerusalem is a temple. That is where God dwells. You see, God promised the children of Israel something. Unfortunately, so unfortunately, they never got hold of it. And they never saw really what God wanted them to do. And, and, and they just didn't follow through on it. In Ezekiel 47, God gave Ezekiel a vision of the temple and outlined in detail how it was to be built and all. And I read that story over so many times and wondered why. Why here he describes it in detail as to what it was be, and they never built it. It was never carried through, never done. And I said, why? 
It's because they couldn't catch the vision that God had in mind. Because you see, they were to be a kingdom of priests and a kingdom of kings. And God had given to them the privilege of taking the message of God's love and sacrifice for them to the whole world. And this city that Ezekiel described was to be the center. And this is where all the nations were to come into and all. So just the same as the sanctuary on earth was a type of what that one in heaven was, so the temple in Ezekiel was a type of what the New Jerusalem is. So I want want you to see and notice the comparison here. Both Ezekiel and John are taken to a high mountain. Okay. They're both... uh, Heavenly, a heavenly being is there to measure the temple. Both cases measure the temple. Both of them have a great and high wall. Both of them, Ezekiel's and the New Jerusalem, have 12 gates with the name of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel over the top of them. Both cities are square. In the city is the throne of God. The Holy of Holies is a cube. The New Jerusalem is a cube. The river flowing out of the temple in Ezekiel, river flowing out of the temple in Revelation. Trees bear their fruit each month in Ezekiel. They do the same in Revelation. The leaves are for the healing in Ezekiel, so they are in Revelation. All those things are exactly the same because God intended for them to take the gospel to the whole world. Unfortunately, that city was never built. But tonight, you have one to look forward to that has been built. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in the light. The kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. They shall come, bring the glory and the honor into it. All the nations will come to the new Jerusalem to worship God, and there shall shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So all these people down through the ages that have followed the Lord and walked with him, this will will make up God's people, and they will come and live in this city. And they'll live in that city throughout eternity. And you will be priests and kings unto God. And that city, the New Jerusalem, over it will be a special name. And the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. God will come and dwell with his people and he will be their God and we shall be his people. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for being so good to us, for loving us, for providing so many wonderful and marvelous things that we can enjoy not just for a day or two, but down through the ages. Lord, bless each one here. May they, may they have their name inscribed in the book of life. May they be among those that will be able to sing glory and praise to you and to serve you. We ask, Lord, that our lives may be surrendered that we might humbly stand before you and have the privilege of worshiping you because of what you've done for each of us.
For this we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this brings us down now to the last chapter, the 22nd chapter of Revelation. The victory is won. God gives some very clear admonition in this chapter concerning the book of Revelation. You don't want to miss it. God bless you.